Hello, and you are listening to Bill Murphy's Red Zone Podcast. I interview leaders who inspire me in the areas of exponential technologies, business innovation, entrepreneurship, thought leadership, enterprise IT security, neuroscience, philosophy, personal development, and more. Welcome to the show. Welcome back to the show, everyone. This is Bill Murphy, your host of the Red Zone Podcast. Today's episode is called Modern Sales. Your customers don't need you anymore. So why did I go down this path of having this type of episode? Do you think the role of a salesman is dead? People are afraid of even using the word salesman these days. You never even see this on a title of a business card. You see titles like business development, account manager, sort of amorphous definitions, and you're never really sure you're dealing with a sales rep or a commission-based salesperson at all. And is this role of a commission-based sales rep dead now? I personally believe that sales is one of the highest and noblest professions of service. Essentially, the more you serve, the more you make. I mean, if you do get that concept as a sales rep, it translates into being very good for the buyer because the sales rep wants to deliver the very, very best to them. Sales reps traditionally exchange the risk of a low to no salary for the reward of a higher than normal income as a result, based on commissions, as a result of the fruits of their efforts. However, for 90% of the profession, they can't even get in front of the decision maker these days. You, they can't even get in front of you because they're stuck in an old paradigm of selling and are too stubborn and possibly don't have the talent to make the switch to modern, effective selling approaches. If reps, if sales reps of the can't even get in front of you, the buyer, then how can they even hope to establish value, coordinate resources for you, solve problems for you, present solution options for you? Back to my thesis. The more you serve, the more you make. So service means you're in front of potential buyers, listening, helping, teaching, educating, taking the heat when necessary. But being in the front line of your company means that you're encompassing all of this, these capabilities, right? Well, who's going to benefit from listening in to today's episode? Well, certainly buyers of security technologies, salesmen certainly in today's modern world, entrepreneurs that are building sales organizations, for sure, sales leaders, marketing leaders in organizations, CIOs supporting sales organizations. You'll enjoy listening to my conversation with Chris Peterson. He's the founder of Vector Firm. Beginning in 2006, Chris recognized a growing chasm between the way organizations purchased security technology and the way it was being sold. He recognized that this was creating a sales force of amazing security account managers who had little time to hunt for new business. Chris has over 25 years of experience in sales and sales leadership with a focus on security system integrators and managed service providers. So that's companies like Red Zone, my company. Chris started Vector Firm with the mission of helping companies in the security industry dramatically improve their sales and marketing performance as these shifts are happening with training, digital marketing services, sales management, and professional speaking. Sales are the oxygen for business. Nothing happens until sales are made within your organizations. Every role within the business ultimately thrives with more revenue coming in, which results in more profits. And it's important for business leaders to understand these shifts that are happening and how we can help modern salesmen be more successful and how we can understand the shifts that have happened. It is so different from 10 to 20 years ago. So with that, I want to welcome to the show my conversation with Chris Peterson. All right. Well, Chris, I want to welcome you to the show today. Oh, thanks, Bill. Appreciate it. So let's start out with kind of your general macro thesis here. Do you think that the concept of a traditional salesperson, hunter, farmer, whatever we want to call it, do you think that concept is alive, dead, well, on the decline? What what are your current thoughts on that? I'd say it's on a decline. It's been on a decline probably for 12 to 
let's say, 15 years, somewhere around there. And I don't want to say it's dead because hard work makes bad technique look okay. So there are a lot of hardworking salespeople out there that are still doing the traditional methods that were taught to them in, in 1985 or 2002, and they're still doing okay. And a lot of the core activity is still very relevant in certain types of selling, a lot of consumer selling. So in real estate, for example, or insurance, a lot of that uh, traditional, when I say insurance, meaning uh, insurance to consumers, a lot of that traditional methodology is still effective. But in business to business sales, anything that costs over $100, I always use that phrase over $100. And it's business to business, it's, it's changed quite a bit. The old ways of going out and pounding on as many doors as you can, throwing as much mud against the wall as possible, trying to manipulate or charm your way past the gatekeeper to get to a decision maker. Two people that don't exist anymore, by the way. There are no more gatekeepers. I, I mean, there, there's a lobby and there's voicemail. Uh, there are no gatekeepers and there are no more decision makers because the decision is usually made by a committee of people nowadays with somebody that sits at the head of the, the head of the table who may be in charge of that committee. But that traditional method, it's just not effective anymore. But some people follow it. So it's it's declining. I don't think it's dead yet, because like I mentioned, a lot of somebody out there could still use a wooden racket. You know, Roger Federer could use a wooden racket and still do pretty darn well playing tennis. He wouldn't yeah. be the best in the world, but he'd still do okay. But why do you want to use a wooden wooden racket when you don't have to? I think the the concept of being talented, at like any sport, any profession, there is a top of the class for any for being a neurosurgeon. If a hundred you know hundred neurosurgeons graduate, there's going to be you know are you being operated on by the guys at the top of the ton twenty percent or the guys at the bottom of the class? And I think. Mm-hmm. So just because they're a neurosurgeon doesn't make them great. Just because they show up at your front door and they're a sales rep doesn't make them great. There's the best of the best and there's the second rate. I I just, it's it's interesting. I wonder if in the past 10 to 15 years, it's just exposed and made an amplified weakness in some respects, meaning that if you couldn't prospect on the phone and pick up the phone and prospect and call people and you weren't good on the phone, does that all of a sudden, because the technology has shifted to LinkedIn and email and and other groups within Facebook and, and uh, you know, building relationships. If you can't do it on the phone, how are you going to translate that into some other model? Well, I think that has something to do with it. What's really happened is, and, and it definitely has exposed weakness. It, it definitely has exposed a lack of integrity. And I share this with people all the time. If you have integrity and you want to sell with integrity and you work hard, then embrace this change because the manipulator who just shows up at 10 30 and goes home at 3 30 those people that used to you know just have a relationship here or there and 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 just schmooze their way through and lie to customers and figure out ways to close the business with very manipulative techniques those days are gone they can't do that anymore there's something out there called the internet that has leveled the playing field for everybody. And what it boils down to is this before the internet, you know, when I, when I got out of school, Bill, I was, I have a mechanical engineering degree from the university of Florida, which is, you know, back then it was a top 15, actually one year. Anyway, it was top 50. We, we, we beat Georgia tech one year. That's in good. The, uh, U S news and world report rankings. And, and I think it was 1991. And, <laughs> and so we were, we were pretty pumped. Anyway, it's a really good, it, it's a strong engineering program, but I wanted to sell. So I, I took my degree and I sold copiers for two years to learn how to sell. And back then, essentially what would happen is you would, you would throw as much mud against the wall as possible, knowing that somebody was going to let you in the door. Cause what would happen is this, we would knock on the door and a decision maker would be in the back and someone would say, Hey, Chris from Danka is here, blah, 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 blah. And they'd say, Oh, geez, I can't see us. I don't have time to see a salesperson, but I got to learn about this. I got to find out what this costs. I got to understand about this, send them back here. So I'd get a few minutes with them. And then that few minutes might turn into a half an hour. And then we have a demonstration schedule. Today, well, first of all, I don't get a chance to walk in a door as a salesperson nowadays because all the lobbies are controlled by by non-humans. But let's just say I did. Today, the person that you want to meet with doesn't need you. All the information is at their fingertips for free on the phone. Now, it's not the best information. Salespeople can usually provide better information 
But why would I want to see a salesperson when I can just go on my phone or on my PC at my convenience when I need something and find the information I want in three minutes? Why do I want to waste my time with a salesperson? So that's the biggest dynamic today. It's not so much that the weakness has been exposed to so salespeople aren't doing that well. The weakness has been exposed as kind of a result of the fact that we don't have the information anymore. It used to be that customers had to come to us for information. They don't anymore. And so why will they see us? Why do they need us? And I mentioned this to you before that this isn't a bad thing for great salespeople. You know, if, if you're a great salesperson, you're in great demand today. If you're an average to poor salesperson, you're obsolete. There's no need for you. So if you want to be a great sales, man, you should be loving what's happening right now. There is a tremendous amount of complexity with both the listeners that are buying on, on my show. And so they're the buyers. And then there's a tremendous amount that they're trying to navigate. And then there's a tremendous amount of complexity on my side of the fence with my teams and trying to educate newbies, basically 20-somethings all the way up to the 30s, just trying to convince them of the new to help them understand. And then the old people, that's a whole other story. The older folks, well, I'm 50, so I'm going to call anybody north of 40 old. The older folks who don't want to learn anymore or the majority of them just kind of uh, – you know, they, they don't have the hunger to learn, or at least that's my perception. How do you navigate the fact that we have to simplify a message that's very in, in a very complex environment? Our, our buyers want to have uh, simplification, yet like, how do you collapse both worlds for the people that you're working with? Yeah, that's hard because it's not just a knowledge gap. I shouldn't say gap, a difference of knowledge base, but it's also a difference in culture, right? The 50-year-old today, and I'm 50 also, and it's kind of nice being 50 because I can just call people old. You know, it's like being an engineering. <laughs> no, it's like, it's like having an engineering degree. I can call people geeks all day, right? Because I'm making fun of myself. So it's it's fun. I've been 50 for about six weeks now and I'm calling everybody old and I'm not worried about them being offended because I'm one of them. <laughs> but um, <laughs> the, the, the there, there is a difference, right? There's a difference in the way a 27-year-old perceives methodologies and systems uh, versus a versus a 50-year-old who's been doing it for 25 years or so. And what I've seen, because what we do, that's what we do. We come into organizations, mostly system integration companies, you know, that do security and pro AV and IT work. We, we help them with their, with their sales organization and, and we help them get to where they need to be today to sell in today's environment. And that sales organization is usually a mixture of the person who is looking at retirement and the person who is looking backwards at college, right? There, and, and then everything in between. So what I've learned is this, uh, the, the folks that have been around a while, you know, there are a few anecdotes that you can share with them that not really and anecdotal evidence, I guess you could say a few scenarios you can share with them that make them understand, wow, you know what? That's true. You know, one of the things that I hear quite often is, Chris, I don't know. I've had these relationships forever. Uh, it's just I don't get it. I've been doing the same thing for 30 years. It worked forever. And then recently it's just not working. I don't know what it is. And when you share these with them when you share the idea of I used to be able to get into you know somewhere between five and ten percent of the accounts that I need to go see now I don't get into any so you know what I'm just going to call on my current customers and then you talk about well it's interesting how we think our customers are loyal in this industry do you really think they're loyal were they that loyal 15 years ago no I got them secure I've been paying attention to them I've been you know they love me now well maybe not Maybe it's just that your competition isn't calling on them because no salespeople call on other companies anymore. <laughs> we all got our own accounts and we don't go after any new accounts, not in the right way anyway. So with the older folks sharing the scenarios with them of what's happened in the last 10 or 15 years and letting them see it logically that, wow, yeah, you're right. And that's why it's changed. And then, you know, Letting them have excuses because the fact of the matter is they've got excuses. The way that they were taught to sell was the same way people have been selling for centuries. And, and I'm not just throwing that word out, really, centuries. And all of a sudden, 
it's changed sometime around 2004, 2005, 2006. And then we hit a recession and it really changed. And now we come out of the recession and it's a new ball game, totally new ball game. So they do have some excuses. Let them share their excuses with you. And then they will, you know, eventually, okay, well now what do I need to do? Because I'm 57 years old. I don't really feel like learning a whole new process. Here's the beauty of it. It's not that different. It's just a little different. It's, but what it's like is changing your grip on your golf swing one little quarter of a centimeter to the right and you're driving that ball 20 yards further. One little change, instead of making 100 phone calls a day, let's make 15, but let's make them with a follow-up email and stopping by and, and sending some blog posts and connecting with them in LinkedIn and making sure they realize that we know what we're talking about and waiting for them to call us because we know we've provided them with the information necessary to where we look like the competent expert instead of being that overly aggressive salesperson that we were taught to be in 1991 to where they get annoyed with us and never call us back because they don't have to today. That's what I've learned with the older folks. And with the younger ones, create your process and teach it to them. And they'll embrace it because the one thing they won't embrace, what I love about the Generation Z folks and, and the millennial folks is I love the fact that you can't get anything by them. You know, our generation just can't stand these people because they challenge us. Because it used to be, look, I'm older than you. You're going to listen to the way we do it and do it. They don't. They challenge us. And if it doesn't make sense, they're not going to do it. Well, the fact of the matter is knocking on 100 doors a day in 2019 doesn't make sense. So they're not going to do it. Trying to manipulate a customer while your mission statement is our customers are ahead of everybody else, doesn't make sense to them. So they won't do it. So come up with a system that makes sense for 2019, that makes sense for the 2020s, and, and then teach it to them, and they usually will embrace that. So that's, that's what I've seen on a macro level. You know, Bill, your organization might be, oh, geez, that's not going to work with my, you know, my sales team. But on a macro level, that's what I've seen. I would agree with that. And I think it's interesting that we, we talk a lot about, um, you know, and I think this is conversation about the older and the younger is really important. And, and this is, I think what's, what's exposing now is what people are really uncomfortable with is, is the speed of change. Um, you know, back when the horse-drawn carriages were here and the skill sets needed to maintain a horse-drawn carriage, to sell a horse-drawn carriage, to keep it, to keep it steady, to keep it operational on the road, and it all changed when the car was invented. And all those changes and those skills had to, to, had to morph over to the car and the horse traders, they were mad because their business was upset and then, uh, but the, they needed skilled labor to move over to cars. And it's the same thing uh, now. It's just, just happening in more industries more quickly is those skilled changes we're seeing quite a bit is that we're from an on-premise world. There's a certain set of skills, but now you're moving that into the cloud and now you're stretched between on-prem and in the cloud, and those skills are needing to stretch. And so we're filling that white space for, for our customers for that. And I believe that the same thing's happening with, with selling. And one of the concepts for innovation for the older folks is, can you unlearn? You learned a whole yeah. set of ways, but what's your ability to unlearn? And I think that's a, that's a sticky point right now, because and I think also many of the 50-year-olds are thinking, oh, I'm on the downward glide path to retirement when the reality is they're going to be working another 40 years. And what's wrong, wrong with that? But how do you sell a long term? You know, what's your value from a if you're imparting wisdom? And I love your concept about uh, breaking things down into processes for the youngsters, because that to try to take someone uh, like you and I, or at least I'll speak for myself, to take my knowledge and try to break it down into component parts. That is really challenging. Yeah, it is. And then to put together a a lesson plan, I guess you could say, or put the material together to teach it to them and then have it implemented and then have it retained. That's tough. That's tough to do. But with the, and this is going to sound harsh, but it's reality. You know, a lot of those folks that couldn't get past the horse and buggy days had to find something else to do for a living. And I, I see friends of mine and they're, we're in a good economy right now and they're looking for jobs right now. And they've been salespeople for 30 years and they've been good salespeople for 30 years and they're not good anymore. And they don't believe that the new way is a good way. And I understand their perspective because all they see is the extreme. 
because there is an extreme. There are books that are written out there talk about using technology. Hey, the you know the customer doesn't come to you until the sale is seventy percent of the way through the cycle anyway. So you've got to create digital marketing to to capture them. And that's true. But if your customer is not coming to you, your prospect's not coming to you until the sale seventy percent of the way through the cycle. That's because you're doing a poor job of selling. It's not because of that's the way it is today. It's because most people are selling poorly. That's why. So they see things like that and, and, and messages like that. You know, they hear messages like relationships don't matter anymore. And, you know, because unfortunately, there's, there's so much information out there. There's a people are trying to do anything they can to get some some attention. You know, it's like watching a debate in politics. Anybody's trying they're trying to do something to get attention during that debate when there's 12 other people up there on stage. And it's like that with people who are throwing content out there. So they'll throw titles out there that say something like, Cold calling is dead. Well, no, it's not. But 1995's cold calling is dead. Or they'll throw things out there like relationships don't matter. And so what ends up happening is the 56-year-old salesperson who has built a career and put three kids through college and has a beautiful house because of relationships reads that. He or she automatically thinks that the, that the younger generation is stupid. And they think that the new way is wrong because they read that one headline. And, and there are books written out there that talk about being being so volatile with your customers. Your customers don't want friends. They want people who are going to guide them. And that's true, by the way. That's true. But customers still want to be customers. Customers still want to be the person that gets the phone calls returned to right away. They don't want to be told what to do. They want it to be suggested to them. So there are a lot of messages, a lot of books, a lot of philosophies out there today that are basically telling a 57 year old salesperson who's been successful forever that, wait a minute, I don't want to do that. That sounds terrible. And that doesn't work either. That new way that is so out there, it just doesn't work. And the old way doesn't work. So, so they're in a bad spot. <laughs> it's, you know, it's interesting it's, though about the relationship. I, I, I was talking to my team about this, no matter how much new technology you have, how fancy it is or how quickly it moves. One thing that's not changing is relationships. And at least my experience, as you know, I, I have, you know, Innovation Forum. I have a podcast. I, we have a vlog that goes out every week. And we've had several, several in the, over the past two years, buyers uh, that have come onto our managed security programs that would come to our innovation events. They thought it was great, but then you'd never hear from them. Say, well, hey, would you like to talk about anything that we do, you know, related to security? And they wouldn't even return our messages. But then all of a sudden, they and they had come to multiple events, and all of a sudden, they call and say, you know what, we, we know exactly what you do. We want you in to do, and it was really interesting. They're very, very clear. The clarity of what they want is super, super high. And that's what's been really stunning is that with a lot of clarity, those are like the greatest to work with because they know exactly what they want. But it was funny going back and forth, back and forth with with emails and communication. This is after that we've had like a beachhead of a relationship because they've come to these free events for a long, long, long time. And then we have this whole context for a quote and all of this and multiple quotes. And it's a great, great opportunity. And I said, well, let's go meet them. Let's go talk to them because we haven't met the team. We just I just the relationship is only at the CIO level. Well, so I go out with my one of my team members, one of the new guys that works with me and we go out and talk to them. And I said, well, what's driving you guys crazy? Like we knew the general stuff. We knew that ah, I'm generally unhappy. I don't want a managed service. We've grown and we don't want the MSP we want a different type of relationship. And uh, I said, we get that, but what's driving you crazy? Then all of a sudden the real conversation began. And it's like the company we're working with, they don't listen to us. They tell us what to buy. We do our own research. We find out what we want to buy. We tell them we've made a decision, and then they keep pounding us. They keep pounding us. We just want the relationship. We want to agree and charge for. We want to agree and charge for. We just need a trusted partner. And I could get that. And that was like three or four stories that were related to that of what they wanted out of the part. They, they weren't transmitting back and forth with email. We didn't get it until we actually sat down. But it was towards the later end of the process, like 90% into the process. And then, yeah. are you finding that uh, common? Uh, is your experience of, of working with different companies? Yeah. So the scenario you just mentioned, it really is where, you know, if I was in front of you right now, I would show a, a, a gradual curve going up and to, to the right. Then that's the way it used to be, right? With a customer, you might go out and, you know, the second call you make, you know, you might, you might get a face-to-face 
90 second, you know, meet and greet with an office manager or something. Right. And then the next time you, you know, you might make an appointment and then there's a little bit, a little bit, a little bit, a little bit, you get a chance to propose, little, maybe propose a second to do a demo, whatever. And then finally you get it today. It's not like that at all. It, on that graph, it's zero, 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 zero. Then they need something and boom, it spikes up and it, it's with clarity. Also, if you're doing your job, if you're not doing your job, then they're not going to reach out to you until they need a third price to compare against two others. But if you're doing your job and making sure that they are aware of what you do and that you're competent and that you're an expert in the, in the things that they need. You know, I share this all the time with people. and I'll, I'll put it in context of an MSP. I mean, I'm, I'm going to really generalize this bill. So tell your tech folks not to beat me up too much. But someone right now, as you and I are doing this this podcast, somebody in your marketplace right now, I mean it right now, this moment is sitting around a conference room table and somebody at that conference room table in the last 20 minutes has said, can we just put this stuff in the cloud and have someone else manage it for us? If at that moment, they're not thinking of you and your company, your salespeople aren't doing their jobs. That's when they call you because for the last 18 months, you've sent 14 emails with content, with white papers, with articles, with case studies, whatever, with absolutely no response from them. You sent them LinkedIn messages. You put little teasers on LinkedIn. You've invited them to your events. You've stopped by when you're in a neighborhood and dropped off a a nice article that was in a trade magazine with your business card. Uh, You left them a few voicemails just to let them know where they're going to go. Whatever it might be, you sent a private message to them on LinkedIn two or three times. You've touched them 27 times in 18 months, not one response. Then somebody in that conference room says, can't we just put this stuff in the cloud and let someone else manage it? And someone in that conference room who your salesperson has been reaching out to for the last 18 months says, yeah, I know exactly who we should talk to. This this lady, boy, she's been sending me all kinds of stuff. And it's really good stuff, though. They seem to know what they're doing. So l- let me call her in here. Yeah, That's l- yep. how it works today. And when you get brought in, they have a clear, very crisp understanding of what they need and what you do for a living. So your only job at that point is not to convince them that they have a problem that you can solve. They already know that. Your job at that point is to establish credibility with them. You know, it's interesting. I I, I think before we started the show, I, I mentioned to you that many of the listeners, a chunk of them are going to be entrepreneurs and some, a, a large variety are going to be CIOs and, and, and CISOs in the technology community. And I always wondered, you know, why can't they go over to the sales of the VP of sales? Why can't they go over to the CMO, the chief marketing officer and listen to this and say, how can I help you get our brand message out into the marketplace? Because I think what a lot of people struggle with is the volume that's needed. Like in the old days, it used to be, if you saw, if you had not the old days, I like to think it's still these days, but the more, uh, I think volume can trump a lot of volume of getting your your material out into the market, your your white papers, your the promotion around the videos that you send out, the, the podcasts, the amount of calls, the amount of LinkedIn messaging. Do you think volume is still a critical component to that and, and having the right context around your message? I think that the content is more important than the volume. Okay. Because here's um a good example. I just a client of mine out of um, St. Paul, Minnesota, forwarded me a message, and it, this is the owner of the company actually. And he said, "Hey, this is a this is a guy who I don't care how often he emails because he always has potentially useful content." And then he forwarded me an email from somebody because we were talking about that recently, about that very question that you just said. And he he referenced this person. He says, "I don't know when he's going to email me. It's not all the time, but when he does, I, I I open his email because I know he's got good content." There's just so much information that is thrown at us nowadays that I mean, you've got to establish yourself as somebody who has who has helpful content for their audience. And I think that's more important than volume. How do you help people get around the trap of sending someone a vendor article isn't helpful content? When you say a vendor article, what do you mean? Like if a vendor, a security vendor says, this is why we think our new security widget is great. And here are all the, the speeds and feeds around this. My experience has been forwarding that to someone 
is not necessarily very useful because they're also receiving five or seven other messages of similar yeah. fashion from other people. So how do you put something in a value-oriented light? Yeah, so first of all, I, and, and all the content that I would send, well, I shouldn't say all, but most of the content, you, you should be thinking about the customer and what they want to read. And usually they want to understand if I've got a problem, I'm going to open that particular email or that that message on LinkedIn or whatever it might be, if it's related to that that common problem. But if there's a piece of content that someone's going to send out, instead of phrasing it like, hey, read this because we're really good and this shows you how good we are and we recommend this. Well, let me back up even a step further. I like shooting information out on an ongoing basis, asking for appointments. And every now and then, if there's something that I can send, just, hey, I thought of you, I thought maybe you... Uh, I just saw this. I thought maybe I'd forward it to you. Yeah, that's okay. But most of the time I have a, by the way, I've attached an article and I I think it might be, this is how we believe X, Y, Z should be implemented. Right. And why we think it's important for um, healthcare facilities like, like you. And, And what that does is it lets them know that, you know, you're thinking about them and their particular vertical market and what their pains are. And secondly, you're not saying, do this, do this, do this. It's not an advertisement. It's like, hey, here's something that we wrote, and I think you might be interested in it. I think that's the best way to position it and let them get their own value. You know, one of the things I learned, uh, it was probably 12 or 13 years ago. I started this company nine years ago. So, um, yeah, about 13 years ago. I was vice president of sales for a manufacturer. And one of the things that we were doing is we were OEMing a daylight camera. I worked for a manufacturer that made millimeter wave radars, thermal imagers, and it provided perimeter security. And one of the things that we needed to do is because we didn't make you know regular CCTV cameras, so we OEM them. We bought them from people, and we had a manufacturer that everybody on the call here or on the podcast has heard of come in because they were very interested. And my boss, our CEO, said, "Hey, will you go to this demo? Because because <laughs> right now we have our technical people going there, and our CTO is going to." really ruined this meeting. So I went to the demo and sure enough, the boss says they show the demo, right? And the boss says to our CTO and director of engineer and other people over there, isn't that the crispest image you've ever seen? Look how great that image is. And I just, it's like watching somebody walk in front of a bus that you know that's coming, right? You just want to, you want to do everything you can to pull them back. And it could have been the crispest image of all time. But my CTO wasn't going to have anybody tell him how crisp an image was. And he just tore this guy up and down. Right. And I learned something there. When you're dealing with bold personalities, when you're dealing with people who are strong uh, willed, which basically is 98 percent of people who are making decisions on purchases, when you're dealing with your customers, essentially, is what I'm saying. Don't tell them how great you are. Share with them what you're doing. And let them come to their own conclusion. And when they come to their own conclusion, they're probably going to figure out that you're doing some good stuff and they should bring you in to solve their problems. So that article, instead of sending it out saying, here's how you should do it, here's what we believe, boom, 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 instead, phrase it differently. Actually, you can say, here's what we believe, but not necessarily, don't don't throw it down their faces. That, Bill, I don't know if I answered your question or not. Well, I'm just looking right now for what you're seeing as far as the kind of the modern way to promote oneself. And I, you know, from the the guys that are, and I, I hate using the word hunters, but hunters really don't need, they don't really care. I mean, they they don't care if they're hunting with a stick or hunting with a gun or hunting with a knife. One way or the other, they're going to come up with the meat necessary to feed the family. But then you've got, but that's like the 10%. And then or maybe even smaller than that. But then you've got like, which is just not reality. It's like, it's, like it's not even, so how teaching people how to add value it's a really, uh, I found it, we've become very, very effective at it, but it's how does an individual write a message that's not about me, just not about themselves. Yeah. And to me, that's, that is in the modern communication is, you know, like you said, I'm, I was just thinking about you. Here's something that I found useful for you for these reasons. So they might not even have a chance to read the whole article, but you've taken out an, uh, a sentence from it that is, is useful for them. Or you watch the video and you found out the one sentence, two sentences at this point in the video, like just simple things like here's a nine minute video I want you to watch. Nobody, he's not going to want to watch a nine minute video. But if you say watch from four minutes and 32 seconds to four minutes, 
or to five minutes and 30 seconds, because I think that's the best part of the video. That's going to get watched. That's going to get watched. And it's also going to tell the person who you sent the email to that you were, you really were thinking about them. That's absolutely right. And, you know, some of the, you know, I've got a, um, I say I, my company, we have an academy. It's a virtual sales training program. But one of the webinars that, that we did is called Getting in the Door Using Email. And we, and, and, and so the, the format that I like to use is you start out with a problem. So using you as an example, uh, hi, Bill. We've learned that a lot of managed service providers are having trouble um, navigating this new world of selling, especially selling managed services to CISOs. Now, all of a sudden, and, and I would get even more greener than that, are having trouble getting in the door of new accounts, especially when calling on CS, CISOs. So you start out the message immediately with that, you know, thinking that I barely know you. I've, I've attached an article that, um, you know, here uh, uh, that I think might help you with this specific problem. And, you know, and like you said, look at look at page two halfway down. But starting out with the problem that that particular type of customer has, and by the way, if you really drill down, 85 to 95 percent of your customer base have the same two or three problems. So it's not like you've got to custom make every one of these emails, but you do tailor each one. You don't just send out a blast. But I like that first line being about your problems. I mean, you said you just turned 50. I just turned 50. You know, someone sent me an email that said, hey, Chris. We've learned that a lot of 50-year-olds that travel a lot on business um, are struggling with uh, maintaining their wardrobe to where they can stay stylish but not look like a 20-year-old. Guess what? I'm going to open that email. <laughs> right. That's true. That is because true. that's something I'm dealing with. So, you know, I, I want to look like I'm 50, but uh, I don't want to look like I'm 75. So I want to figure out there. I just offended more old people. <laughs> with Good. that statement. We all need it. <laughs> That's right. But that that particular email, I would keep reading because it starts out saying, we know about your problems and, and why don't you open up this article? But if you keep doing that, and it's not just by email, you know, one of the things that we, we, we got, and I don't mean to keep advertising our services, but we've got a content marketing program. And, and what we've noticed is a lot of digital marketing companies out there are great at digital marketing, but they have the same approach to a system integration company as they have to a tapas restaurant or a running shoe company. And they're different. Your customers do not click coupons so they can buy more managed services on Thursday night between five and seven. So what we've got to do is combine that content marketing by sending it out through digital formats, but also having salespeople take it out on traditional methods, putting together PowerPoint presentations or, or Prezi presentations where uh, salespeople can deliver them at association meetings and at trade shows and, and putting together eBooks that can be shared through social media and that, uh, that also can be printed and dropped off the old fashioned way to some key customers by salespeople. That material has got to be delivered in such a hybrid way in order for everyone to really grasp it. So it's not just by email, it's several ways that content's got to get out to people. One of the things I've observed, and I just wanted to see what your thoughts are, is that because I've struggled so much to find hunters and as I've actually broken the roles out such that marketing now does really everything that I would have expected a salesperson to do as far as going out and finding new opportunities and reaching out via LinkedIn and doing things of that nature via content creation and such. And then we've further broken down the marketing group into, we call it a SDR, kind of a, someone who can follow up after events, more, they're more on the phone trying to talk to people, follow up on, on different items that we've sent out. And then the account manager is really responsible for maintaining the customer relationship. The AM is really, they're farmers. They're, they're definitely more motivated by taking care of and making sure the farms that have already been plowed and cleared, they're, they're not filling up with weeds. So they're responsible for going and visiting the existing customers and such. And then account executives are in, in charge of new business. But we've taken away from the AEs, not taken away, but we're basically hedging our bet that all marketing is replacing that cold calling capability. And we've been quite successful with that model, but it, not across the board, not with all roles. And I'm just curious, how do you find kind of the modern selling uh, organization is structured? Does it follow a similar model to that? Or is it, have you found it just varies from company to company? 
What I've seen, and this, that's right, this, right now. So in five years, it's going to evolve. But right now, what I see is that is is there's an overlap, and there's got to be an overlap. So the work that marketing is doing, marketing should be able to distribute it through certain digital formats and and non digital formats, but send their content out in that method. And then this is in an ideal world how companies will do it. That same exact material, whatever the message is, whatever the you know, the particular campaign is for the quarter, let's say. That same material is being used by salespeople to get in the door. And then it's the same material that your account managers are using to educate and nurture the relationships with the current customers. And maybe they're having, with their top five customers, they're each having these half-day lunch and learns where they're educating. It's the same message, but it's just delivered in an educational fashion to marketing. So, now you've got companies out there that, uh, and, and and by the way, there are, are presentation decks that are created for salespeople and business development people, for example, to go out to associations and present. And this is done, you know, on a periodic basis where it's the same message every quarter, maybe every six months, and you're driving home that message. So I look on LinkedIn. I don't I don't know who the heck Red Zone is, but I look on LinkedIn and I keep seeing these guys come up with some pretty cool content about the same message, right? Same same problem that that hospitals are having. I'm just going to make up hospitals. Um, healthcare is having. Oh, that's pretty good. And then I go to a, uh, I go to an association meeting next Thursday, and I see a speaker from Red Zone talking, or maybe Red Zone introduces a, a, an expert speaker to come up and speak on their behalf. And then I keep getting these uh, emails, and, and a salesperson stops by, you know, every four weeks or so, and drops off some really interesting content. And the content is similar to what I saw on LinkedIn, but maybe it's in a different format. Right. And then I hear from one of my peers that they work with Red Zone and they just did a lunch and learn on this very topic. Guess what? I'm pretty soon I'm going to figure out you guys know what you're doing. So where I, I like where you're going, Bill, is the fact that you are going somewhere. Right. You're shifting. You're having marketing take on these activities where, you know, like we talked about earlier before we started recording, it's not so much a hunter anymore. It's more of a fisherman. So you got to put bait out there. You can't be a hunter. Hunting isn't allowed anymore in business to business. Fishing is, though, because you've got to put bait out there. And when they are hungry, then they come to you because you put out the proper bait. That's what marketing in your organization is doing. I think that's great. But I think there's a, an, what I would recommend is you have more of an overlap where your account executives are taking that content and they're still making their calls, but they're not calling on everybody where maybe they had 250 prospects each in 2003. Today it's 30. Oh yeah. That makes sense. That makes sense. But they're using the same content. Yeah, that's right. So if you think of a pyramid, right. And the bottom third of the pyramid are customers that you may take, but you don't care if you get them or not. And the top third are the ones that you have to have. You know, I, I like to say that, you know, that top third and really, a good chunk of the second third, the account executives and marketing should be working on. And then that bottom third, salespeople shouldn't even be touching. Marketing should just be dripping information to them. Right. I find it fascinating. I find it, uh, I really like this, the new world we're in, but the paying attention to context and the trend, what's really pushing me very hard and I'm, I'm going to change and adjust, but holy crap, just for me, just forgetting and just leaving the old ways of doing things behind, that's completely the game right now because it's really about educating my own internal teams. It's completely almost that, like your academy we got to talk about afterwards because like, I have to train my buyers. They're, they're not going down in their expectation levels. And, and I find that going into meetings and I'm like, holy crap, this guy doesn't even know how to put together an agenda. Not my buyer, but like my internal team member doesn't know how to put together a proper agenda for the meeting. Right. So th- there's no, you can't even stay on point with like helping the customer. So I leave the meeting going, oh my God, I thought I had to train about the technology. <laughs> but now right. I got to go back and train because I can't count on a 22 year old, 24, 26 of being able to craft an agenda. And I learned the hard way. I learned because I almost lost my job when I was 26 because the manager came up to me and said, Hey, listen, man, you're, it seems like you have a great funnel, but you really, you're not getting the business closed. And, and I had to learn that I had to be really intentional about my agendas. So, so anyway, that's my challenge right now. And I, I, I'm wondering if I'm just an island in the sea or if I'm like an embodiment of what you're running into with entrepreneurs and business leaders. 
No, it's it, a lot of the basics aren't there. A lot of them don't have to do it like we had to do it. Just simple, something simple like a presentation. You know, I'm all about progress. I should say I'm all about progress. I appreciate progress. And when my peers talk about how great it used to be, how TV was better 30 years ago, I'm like, really? You had three stations. You're telling me you're going to take Simon and Simon over all the good stuff we have today? I mean, come on. <laughs> or all oh, the movies were so much better before. Are you kidding me? These movies are fantastic nowadays. My gosh, the gra- everything. So anyway, I'm all about appreciate what we have today and stop being in this euphoric recall of how great it used to be. However, with that said, I will take the 1995 salesperson 10 out of 10 times giving a presentation over today's salesperson. Today's salesperson cannot give a presentation. They cannot develop an agenda, like you said. Some of the basics aren't there. So yeah, you got to figure out what it is that those incoming you know, 25, 30 year olds don't have and be able to teach it to them because it's, there are things that we learned in high school, college, and just being a part of life that they don't have to do anymore. Spelling. I know it sounds crazy, but spelling. Mm-hmm. Because it's just not taught. These things are not taught like they were taught to us. I just insulted young people now too. They can't spell. Old people can't dress. <laughs> so I think I think every every generation has its issues for sure, and every every older generation always looks back at the at the younger and wishes it was different. I don't think it's any different uh, what we're saying. I think what's happening though is that uh, as as business owners and leaders that are not retiring and they're not looking for a landing strip anytime soon. It's how do you, so I think innovation is about how do you, can you go fast? How can you create a culture that goes at the speed of of the way in which the modern enterprise is moving? And and it's not like the 20 somethings. I've had great experience with with my uh, younger folks on my team. We just have to shore up the, the soft spots. And, and and so like the agenda development, it's, and it's not about the technology. It's about how do you show up and make a great first impression from a security perspective? Like what I'm talking about is, all right, we want to have a vibe that we've got their backs covered. Like you want to like show up and and present like you've got their backs covered because that's what you end up going to you're what you're going to end up doing for people. But if you show up late or you show up without an agenda or if you show up and don't instill confidence, and that to me is an, uh, a really powerful challenge. And um, I'm I just want to make sure in talking to you that I'm not like uh, the only person out there that's uh, no. got that <laughs> no. If you if you figure that out, quit your job and write a book. <laughs> You'll, uh, yeah. Yeah. Well, Chris, as we get wrapped up here, what is something that pretty much has been your claim to fame, like your superpower when you're, when you're working with, with organizations, what is the one main thing that you're able to really deliver and really make it an exponential impact with companies that, that allow you to? I, I think where we've had an impact is in the focus. And we haven't even talked about that, but where it used to be throw as much mud against the wall as possible and see what sticks. And and it really was true. I, I succeeded because of my volume and my effort and how efficient I tried to be. Um, I, I had a better path of cold calling than UPS drivers had in my, in, in my territory. And that's what mattered. Uh, today, volume doesn't matter unless the content is really, really strong, unless there's a reason. You know, it used to be no matter how well you cold call, or how bad you cold call, you're going to get into, you know, whatever, 3% of the calls you make are going to schedule an appointment with you. Today, that's not true. And it's not true as far as presentations go, as far as demos go. So what we need to do and, and what where, where we've had a lot of success is helping our clients identify and also be comfortable with understanding where your, your core competence is and understanding what marketplace you want to go after. So I mentioned earlier, instead of having 300 prospects, you have 30. And I mean that. I mean, we really take our client salespeople. Okay, how many prospects do you have? Well, I don't know. I just call on whoever. Okay, do you realize how much time? You, let's look at how much time you're wasting. And so instead of Will Smith's character in the pursuit of happiness, when you know he had all those strategies to where he didn't go to the bathroom, he didn't eat, he didn't drink, and he ended up making 11 cold calls more a day than his counterparts, and that translated to 55 a week or whatever it was, that's not the case anymore. Today, we need to figure out, okay, how are we going to make sure that when I go in and I give a presentation, that when I leave, those folks are saying, wow, where has that person been? Oh, my gosh. The, that company is way different than any other company because guess what? Because what I did is I focused on my presentation. I focused on my proposal. I tailored it to them, and I, I, I focused on what their problems were, and I made myself more valuable to them than Google. 
Same thing with prospecting. Instead of sending, you know, mass emailing and, and doing 40 phone calls an hour, how about this? How about doing four emails and four phone calls in an hour? And you construct those emails where you do a little research on social media to understand their interests. You, you, you look a little bit for their, and then you do that for maybe 10 contacts a week. And over six weeks, you've done it for 60 accounts. And then you do it again, right? I mean, I'm just making those numbers up. But if there's anything to answer your question, if there's anything that we've done to help our companies go from, really, our clients, one client went from 13 to 31 million in, in, in less than three years. And it had to do with their salespeople tightening up what they did. And then once you tighten up, then you can implement the strategies of today. Because if you don't tighten up and focus, you can't. Because the strategies of today take thought, takes creativity, and they take time. And you can't do that if you have a 1,000 customers you're trying to work on. So the narrow down, I would say, the exponential success that our clients have had has, has been when we're able to go in and help them really, really, really focus. Because when they do that, then they can implement our ideas. If they don't do that, our ideas are useless. I love that, Chris. Well, I focus, and um, I couldn't agree more than that. That is a great way to end our conversation. And is there anything as as we wrap up that you think we missed? No, Bill, I that was a great conversation. There's, um, I, I think if there's anything to leave everybody with is, Some of the core fundamental items are still, relationships still matter. Persistence still matters. Uh, Being intelligent still matters. These are things that, you know, the core professional behavior still matters. Don't think everything has changed. Don't all of a sudden get a Twitter account and think you can work two and a half hours a week. You can't. You've got to really still work very, very hard. And, you know, a lot of it's changed, but but the, the core elements of being a sales professional are still the same. Yeah, I agree. I definitely agree. And the relationships we had talked about today, the uh, as you mentioned, just even the volumes uh, and keeping the, the ones that you're saying, being intelligent versus just pounding and how you're communicating and which channel and respecting the fact that if you're going to be communicating on a LinkedIn channel versus email channel, that's going to be different than phone calling and leaving a voicemail message. It's just all matters these days. I really appreciate you for your uh, words of advice and and wisdom with my audience today, Chris. No, thanks, Bill. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye. So there you have it. This wraps another episode of Bill Murphy's Red Zone podcast. To get all the relevant show notes, please go to our blog at www.redzonetech.net forward slash podcast. Additionally, make sure you go to iTunes and leave your comments in iTunes about the show. This helps our show rankings enormously and it helps support the show. Until next time, I appreciate you very much for listening. Thank you.